uh, session, part of the CAR conference. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers, Merck, for uh, coordinating this meeting. I'm Dr. Chris Fraser from uh, Victoria. I work at the Kool-Aid Community Health Center there, doing primary care in HIV and hepatitis C. And um, it's a, it's a uh, very nice day. For those of you from out of town, I just want to let you know, every day of the year is like this in Vancouver. So uh, this is just another normal day here. But thank you for coming, despite those conditions. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bertrand Leboucher, who is from, currently from uh, McGill University Health Center, but originally from France, as I learned today. And uh, he's an MD, PhD, uh, practicing clinician at uh, the McGill University Health Center, and leading very innovative research to do with our topic today about individualized management of people living with HIV. He's doing innovative research um, to do with patient reported outcome measures for HIV care and how to really move forward with aging patients with HIV to provide optimal care. And uh, we're going to have a very dynamic presentation from Bertrand and then I encourage you to think about questions you'd like to pose to him because we'll have circulating microphones afterwards. So uh, very much looking forward to your comments. Bertrand, thank you very much. <clears throat> Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Euh, je remercie les organisateurs de CAR pour cette invitation. Je remercie aussi Merck for, for leur support. And now I will switch in English because I think it's much easier for everyone here. Um, thank you everyone and thank you CAR for inviting me to, to, to present this uh, symposium to start the conference. Uh, I want to just to, to, to show you my potential uh, a conflict of interest. Uh, today, I want to, to examine with you how we can individualize HIV treatment, combination of ARC, even in 2018, and to try to balance the uh, expectation of healthcare provider, particularly clinician, and also to, uh, to emphasize the people living with HIV needs, and how we can address these needs before art initiation or art switch. And also, uh, I want to finish with you to discuss, uh, I think, the gap, the data gaps we have actually, and how uh, we can improve these data gaps, uh, particularly by implementing new patientreported.com in uh, chronic uh, HIV care. So if you want to individualize, that's, it will be my, uh, my work with you today. Uh, possibly we can space out follow-up uh, we can discuss to choose art with minimal interference in daily life. Uh, we can adapt art with single treatment regimen, multiple treatment regimen. We can use, why not, neutral art with very few drug-drug uh, uh, interaction. Or we can uh, individualize depending of comorbidity or even depending of existence of not of a pregnancy. Uh, we can also individualize when we switch. And uh, with the new combination of art, uh, most of them are actually under review. Uh, can we have a new, uh, can you increase the patient perspective to evaluate this combination of art? And uh, after I went to discuss with you, I'm wondering if undetectability actually is not like a tree hiding a forest. Uh, and I will finish with, uh, uh, what I'm doing actually with my team is to try to develop an electronic ePro, patientreported.com, with the I-score study. So, art individualization. So, you know uh, that more than me, we have a lot of effective treatment, combination of art actually, and many of our patients are doing better with, f and they use uh, treatment with uh, fewer toxicity, uh, possibly we have a less frequent follow-up for some of them and they have increased lifespan. But my question today is, is there still opportunity to individualize treatment? And possibly you know this uh, recent uh, paper from Lancet Aishavi and uh, what is interesting is this paper that even after 1996 we continue uh, to increase uh, the lifespan of our patients uh, 10 uh, uh, nine years for women and 10 years for men for most of the population except some uh, particularity. And uh, possibly if we uh, continue with the last combination of art, we will, con we will improve 
uh, or uh, their uh, their life. So I think it's really interesting because we even in two so I think even in 2018 we can do better. So of course we have a new, new family, the family of Integras uh, since almost 10 years. Raltegravir was under the market 10 years ago. Uh, it's the future, and the future is now. So really, it's a very interesting uh, uh, treatment family with a rapid HIV viral load decline, with low rate resistance, or low rate of transmitted resistance, with less chance of side effects, with very few drug-drug interaction for most of them, uh, and with fewer pills, and uh, some of them are even uh, co-formulated in single treatment regimen. So it seems really interesting. I need you check, uh, I don't use the last one because uh, even for the DHHS, they integrate uh, big Tegravir, FTAF, and it's not actually approved in Canada. But you can see in this uh, uh, IES uh, USA 2016 guidelines, so they, they discuss a new class of optimal initial regimen, and uh, they just keep four treatment, four combination. And I don't know if you saw uh, a paper in Medscape two, three days ago from uh, Paul Sachs. And he explains that possibly we have just to, to keep just two combinations of art. So I don't know what you think about that, but if you have a less optimal regimen, is it still room for individualization? And that's the problem, you know? If you have the same suite for anyone, I'm not sure the same suite fits all. And what I want to discuss with you today is say, it is that we have to individualize and to have to use possibly more than two combinations of art. And we have a lot of opportunity to individualize a, a regimen of treatment. We have medication factor with efficacy, with safety profile, with neutral art, with genetic barrier, with forgiveness when you uh, miss some dose, uh, the rate of transmitted resistance, dosing frequency. And you have also individual factor depending to the patient with the HLR, with the drug resistance result, and a concomitant medication when you have comorbidity, and also patient preference. So one, one thing to, if you want to individualize, it could be to space out follow-up, because many of our patients are doing well. Uh, normally, a few years ago, it was a follow-up every three months, and after it, will, it was every four months. Actually, even for me, I have some patients, it's every six months. Even I have patients, it's every year, because they, they don't want to go to see me more than every year. So I tried to, to ask them to come more frequently, but they told me, okay, see you next year. So I have to adapt, you know? Uh, and most of the time, we don't need to see them more frequently, but the problem is if something wrong happened for them between these two visits, how I can I know that? And I'm not sure they will come back on time. So on adherence in 2017, it's a really interesting uh, conference in Miami. Uh, they present data from two big HIV cohorts in United States, and they want, uh, their question were, if visits are spaced out, are we able to maintain the same undetectability before and after? So they check, and they see that when patients have a space out between two visits, less than nine months, it's okay, they can maintain their undetectability. But if you have a space out for more than 12 months, they show that in these two uh, cohorts that 44% came back with detectable viral load for one other one, and for the other one, 23%. So it's not only to individualize, just to space out follow-up, we have to, to take information between these two visits, and how can this patient living with HIV give us more information between these two visits, and it could be one of the reasons of developing patient-reported outcome. So I can give you this clinical case of Marcelo, he's one of my patients, and he was a very stable patient. You know, he was under welfare income, he has nothing to pay, no copayment, antiretroviral were free for him, and he was undetectable almost since August 2012 with Darinavir boosted regimen. And finally, in January 2015, he got a new job. A new job, not well, well paid, but a new job for the Montreal School Board. And suddenly, it changed. So it means that he, he, 
he had to apply for a private insurance. And with this private insurance, he has suddenly to pay $400 to get his treatment because he will pay a co-payment of almost once, a bit more than $1,000, but in three months. So he stopped his treatment because he didn't, have, he didn't get uh, enough money to, to, to pay for that. And he was a bit humiliated, so he didn't come to see me. So finally, it was the pharmacy who asked me, oh, we didn't see your patient. He didn't do his refill, you know? And so the patient finally came and we tried to find a solution. We switched. We have a, a card of copayment with Viv, and he was able to, to, to get Dolutegravir, uh, Abacavir, Sweet EC, and now he's very stable, undetectable. But you know, my question is, how can I have this information, you know? If I, w um, I just wait the, the result of the viral load, but it's a post-failure surrogate marker. So how can I give this information and to help my patient to, to find a solution before he stops his treatment by himself? So for individualization, uh, several years ago, uh, I work on, uh, you know, it was during the treatment as prevention onset, and we want to know if we have to treat everyone for personal reason and also to, to decrease and to stop transmission to others. Uh, I, I asked some uh, experts in HIV what, what are for them the most important criteria uh, we have to prioritize to, to choose an early antiretroviral treatment. And, to, uh, and they told me, oh, you have to use something with tolerable, with few side effects, with few toxicity, uh, with, with simple. And really, you have to individualize to patient perspective because all of our patients don't have the same life. And you have to, to try to adapt the treatment to the patient and not the patient to the treatment. As they told me also, for virologic efficacy, if you use a combination of art with already approved, if the patient takes the treatment, you will have undetectability. And we try to combine all these uh, criteria together and we, we develop the yeah, like a conceptual framework of minimal interference in spatial life. So if you want to, 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 to choose a new combination of art, is to, to, to try to, to choose a combination of art will interfere uh, with a minimal interference with daily life of our patients. So at the, uh, when we did that, it was uh, five, six years ago, it was, uh, we, we had a very interesting data with rategravir, with uh, reduced drug-drug interaction, reduced drug-disease interaction. Uh, after that, we have, uh, with, uh, with uh, PATH, we have a uh, possibility to use less toxic backbone, also to, to use uh, uh, an abacavir-based backbone. And it was also individualization uh, to each patient context and to tailor uh, treatment. So that's what we did, and we, we present this data, and this, this data, this uh, new conceptual framework we have published. But my question is, if you want to be sure to get a combination of art with minimal interference with daily life of our patient, we have to ask them. So that's why I will uh, show you this after, at the end of my presentation. That's why we developed the interference score, like a new patient reported outcome, to have the patient perspective of this minimal interference. So also we could have the art characteristic to help us to individualize. And uh, you can tailor, you know, all the integrase inhibitors are not the same. And particularly with Raltegravir, you can tailor regimen. You have advantage, is you have the longest safety record for integrase inhibitor, is since 10 years in the market. You have the fewest drug-drug interaction. You have no food requirement. And we have very interesting data superiority between atazanavir boosted and darunavir boosted is recommended in pregnancy and you can use it. And now with this entrance HD, you can use it QD. Of course, you have this advantage, it's not available as a single treatment regimen and you still have to, to take two tablets. And you can see uh, it was uh, this data of on one SMERC study we are presented during IS in 2017 and you can see there is uh, uh, an equivalence between uh, isentres QD, uh, isentres HD, and isentres BID. 
Also, you can tailor regimen with Elvitegravir Cobicista. The advantage is available as a single treatment regimen with QD dosing, is superior to Atrazenib boosted with women, uh, is available also as a single uh, tablet with uh, uh, Tenofovir uh, FTC or TAF FTC, and is very small pill for Elvitegravir Cobicista FTAF. So it's interesting. As a disadvantage, you have drug-drug interaction, and particularly with corticosteroid, it could be a huge problem. Uh, is only co-formulated also, uh, and uh, you have normally to, to use it with food. You can also tailor, you have specificity with dolutegravir. Is an advantage, is available as a STR, and also is available alone uh, with TVK. He has a high barrier to resistance, is one of his uh, particularity, no food requirements. He has very interesting data, particularly uh, with uh, treatment experienced patients, who is uh, superior to raltegravir, and he has a small size when he's co-formulated, as a disadvantage with abacavir, sweet EC, um, and dolutegravir is the biggest uh, pill for STRs that we have actually. And he, sometimes you can have uh, side effects like insomnia and headaches. It, it was uh, uh, developed and it was discussed uh, since two years actually. And is uh, uh, only co-formulated with abacavir sweet TC. So you know for each of these integrase inhibitor, you can individualize depending of the, of the, patient, of the context of your patients. But also I think don't forget uh, darunavir, ritonavir, uh, PI, I, I know that they are, uh, they are not an uh, optimal regimen or preferred regimen in the uh, American guidelines, actually, but I think there are still advantage with a very long safety record, with the highest barrier to resistance, and you c it's recommended also in pregnancy, and you, it's available as a generic, and soon it will be available as a single treatment regimen. As a disadvantage, of course, you have also drug, still drug-drug interaction, and you could have also sometimes more toxicity or more side effects. And you can see it was presented uh, during ID week. It's, uh, uh, it was a study, the Emerald uh, study for DCF-TAF. DCF-TAF is interesting because it will be the first uh, protease inhibitor in a uh, single treatment regimen. And uh, what is interesting also that the backbone is F-TAF. So you can see they, they had very interesting data, particularly with bone and renal safety were very interesting at week 48. But, um, and I don't know why, but it's already approved in Europe, and the name is Simtuza. Uh, it's not yet approved in, in Canada, nor even in, uh, by the FDA in United States. I know that European people, European clinicians, they, they are very interested with uh, uh, pro protease inhibitor based regimen, but I think it could be interesting also uh, to individualize with this treatment uh, for our patient even in Canada. So what you can do also is you can individualize with an ART adaptation. So it's single treatment regimen versus multiple treatment regimen. So you know, with single treatment regimen, you have a, a lot of advantage, a few disadvantages of that, of course, the simplicity, the convenience, Fewer copay also because you have just one pill, uh, reduced selective non-adherence, uh, and some disadvantage, uh, it's, you are unable to, to adjust components. Uh, it's not available for all regimen, and it's not available with all NRTI regimen. And what is interesting in this study, it was a recent study from France uh, published in PLOS, and on plus, and what is it, they, they give, uh, they have a big database of uh, more than three, uh, uh, 35,000 HIV patients. And they check with the patient, uh, 3,000 patients, we started their uh, first line regimen between 2004 and 2013. And they want to know why some patient, what are the characteristics of the patient who have, we receive a single treatment regimen, and for those, we receive a multiple treatment regimen, particularly uh, a regimen with darunavir boosted or with raltegravir. And what was interesting is they explained that it's, uh, it's two different profiles of patients. For the uh, patients uh, with single treatment regimen, most of the time they are younger, they are uh, more often male, they have higher CD4, they have a lower HIV viral load, and they are uh, less often uh, AIDS uh, stage. So, and they explained that finally, if you uh, 
uh, if you don't take into account V-logic failure, most of the time uh, you will have the same, almost the, the same uh, uh, length, uh, durability with single treatment regimen or multiple treatment regimen. And what is interesting also, it's a study from Guaraldi and his team in Modena in Italy. And they just check uh, retrospectively why some of their patients are under single treatment regimen and other ones are with uh, uh, multiple treatment regimen, in particular with raltegravir. And they explained that what was uh, significant is the polypharmacy. So if, you, uh, if their patient uh, receive more than five medics, uh, outside antiretroviral treatment, they were more with multiple treatment regimen, and particularly, they explained that uh, it was uh, easier for uh, clinicians, because they asked clinicians, a clinician told them that it was easier to manage uh, with multiple treatment therapy when you have uh, polypharmacy. So you think it's really, we can individualize with the context, particularly the context of polypharmacy uh, of all patients. What was interesting also in 2017 in Adherence, they present that there is like, you know, something a bit weird because we have new class of antiretroviral treatment. We are very durable. And at the same time, they show that we have actually a reduction of the durability with this new combination of art in our patients. And so they explain that possibly it could be because we have choice to to, to, to change for, uh, uh, to have a single treatment regimen instead of multiple treatment regimen, or to have less uh, drug, uh, drug interaction, or just it was a fatigue and they want to, to use something new. But it was interesting that even you have treatment more durable, combination more durable, uh, patient uh, remain less with this uh, new durable uh, combination. So, if you want to individualize, one of the things we can do is to use some neutral antiretroviral. So what, what does it mean, neutral antiretroviral? You know the question, huh, I told you before, the question of polypharmacy is really important. And in, the, in this quote from Netherlands, they explained that possibly in 2030, they will have 40% of their patients with potential important drug-drug interaction between actual uh, combination of ART and the other treatment they can take for comorbidity. So of course we will, we, we will have, we will need uh, for a long time pharmacies to help us to deal with this drug-drug uh, uh, interaction. And you can know, uh, you can see uh, on this table that we have neutral antiretroviral. So of course one of the best is raltegravir with very few drug-drug interaction, but also with dolutegravir and bictegravir except metformin you don't have a lot of drug-drug uh, interaction. Sometimes you can switch to decrease uh, some comorbidity, uh, and uh, particularly there is a, an interesting study we were presented uh, in IAS last year. It, for patients, we were on boosted PI regimen, and they were switched to a dolutegravir, a boost, uh, do, dolutegravir based regimen, and they show that when they did that, they improved the lipid profile. So sometimes you can individualize for patients with hyperlipidemia, and you can increase uh, this and to ameliorate this uh, lipid profile by switching to dolutegravir. Also, we have a, actually in, the, in our backbone, we have the new generation of tenofovir, the TAF, tenofovir alafinamide, and we know that even whatever is your EGFR at the beginning, you will be able to stabilize and not to worsen your EGFR when you switch with a tough based therapy. So also it could be interesting, and you can also uh, change some of your osteoporosis to osteopenia for 20%. So of course it could be interesting also for our aging patient or some uh, patient with osteoporosis or osteopenia. So it's possible also to individualize to emerging HIV population. And one of these HIV pop, uh, emerging population is the, of course we have uh, a, long, uh, a long life with most of our patients, we, so we have an aging HIV population. And Guaraldi and his team, uh, it's interesting because they, they explained this article that we have to develop like a, a new speciality, like a mix of 
HIV specialty and geriatric specialty, like a HIV geriatric discipline. So to extend that with this aging population is not only a matter of CD4 or undetectability of viral load, but also you have to, to deal with an optimization of survival without incapacity, and you have to possibly to space out or not following up with depend less on HIV than comorbidity in this aging population. And we know actually, even in the emergency room, most of the time it's not a problem due to HIV. If there is the emergency room, it's a problem due to other comorbidity. So we possibly we need recommendations specific to this uh, aging HIV population. So if we want to leave an, an aging on half, of course we could have certain characteristic of combination of art to individualize to this population. Uh, neutral art, adherence challenge, toxicity. And in my uh, clinic, in the chronic virus services, we have actually an, a new emerging population. It's a nor or recent migrant flow. So since September, we received, due to Trump and Trump efficacy, we received uh, almost 140 patients, new uh, naive patients, uh, from uh, uh, most of them from Haiti, from Nigeria, from Angola, from Zimbabwe. And what was it? So it was an average of 18 new patients each month. And two weeks ago, we received 14 new patients in the same week. Uh, so it, it, it's really interesting. It's a, sometimes a big mess in our uh, clinic because of that, because we know we will increase from almost 10% uh, cohort in one year because of this uh, new uh, patients, and 40% of them are uh, late presenter. 25% uh, have an advanced HIV disease, and 20% of them, they have a viral load more than 100,000 uh, 100, uh, copy, of course, and they don't have only HIV. Most of the time, they have uh, PTSD. They have, most of the time, they have also comorbidity. So we have to deal with, and we have to help them with, uh, and it, it, we need a lot of, a huge team to help them. And actually, we, can, we have three main categories. We have the refugee. With the refugee, we have no problem because of the federal programs, all is covered. We have uh, patients with humanitarian demand. So until recently, the, uh, they don't have to, 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 to cost more than almost $6,500. But it did change last week, so we will see what we can do now. The most, problem, most problematic uh, subpopulation is with uh, international students. And we have to find a new, uh, new way to treat this population. And uh, recently, me, I received four international students in, in three weeks, and it's a huge problem. I can, you can see with this clinical case of Mo, he's from Tunisia. So you know, he just came in June 2017 uh, for accountant studies. He was diagnosed in a, a specific clinic, CDEP Plus. It's a really interesting clinic. It's a, a clinic led by uh, public health in Montreal. And you can receive, it's near the gay village, downtown Montreal, and you can receive free tests for HIV, for STI, but also you can receive free viral load, free uh, CD4. And yeah, some tests are free, so that's really interesting. And we use this uh, a new uh, testing center a lot. So when we discussed with him, he, he had a symptom of primary infection uh, in July. And he has an international uh, student insurance. So he was covered only for $3,000. And with $3,000, you can do anything for treatment, for blood tests. Even he has to go to, in my hospital to the emergency room just to put one feet in the emergency room is $1,500. So what can you do after? So what we did with him, we didn't do any uh, genotypic test, any uh, chest X-ray, any HLA, because we don't have money for that, and it was not paid by the CDEP Plus uh, clinic. So we just do viral load, CD4, CBC, you know what we can do, uh, renal function, uh, uh, kidney function, uh, hepatic function, and after we, we ask uh, to, to receive his treatment. So he received treatment for the max card from Gilead to, to receive the treatment free for six months, you know. But so, and actually, me, I didn't charge anything for him. But the hospital charged for administrative cost, $130. So he told me, I don't want to see you because it's too costly. So can I call you? you know? So you can see the problem of individualization with these patients. He don't receive the right care. 
It's not a good quality of care. And if we continue, come, if we have something wrong in his life, I don't know how we will deal with that. So that's why we have to, we try actually to ask the government to give us some money to a specific fund for this population to, because I, I can't say, uh, I can't uh, leave him alone. So you can also individualize with comorbidity. So, and with the treatment we have actually, if you have cardiac, cardiac risk, you can just check on the uh, guidelines, American guidelines, Quebec guidelines for, uh, if you are in Quebec, even European guidelines. And you know that you have to avoid abacavir on, uh, or uh, lopinavir boosted regimen. For osteoporosis, you will try to use staph or use abacavir. Hyperlipidemia, if you have chronic kidney disease, of course, staph is really interesting, or you can use abacavir. If you have co-infection, actually, we receive, uh, due to this refugee, we receive a lot of co-infected with hepatitis B. Or of course, you have to deal with that and to use something with efficient also for hepatitis B. For hep C also, you have to use treatment with less drug-drug interaction, drug abuse, so psychiatric illness. So you can, you can individualize depending on the comorbidity also. You, also, you can also individualize in HIV pregnant women. Of course, with this uh, uh, new uh, population of uh, migrants, we receive a lot of uh, uh, pregnant women. Actually, in your court in, in McGill, 33% of our uh, HIV patients are women, with a decrease of uh, the median age due to this uh, refugee. So in case of pregnancy, so it's the case of Tina. Uh, she, she just she newly diagnosed with HIV, and uh, you know, so she has 400 CD4, uh, 54,000 copies as a, for a viral load. She is HLA negative. She's in the first semester of pregnancy. So I discussed with her, what do you want uh, for your treatment? And she told me, I'm okay, but I just want to, I don't want to, to have jaundice or something like that because I have to work with public. So what is the best recommendation option for her? So you can see the, the last current American recommendation. So you can use boosted PI, darunavir boosted regimen, atazanavir boosted regimen, but also you can use integrase inhibitor. I think for me it's better tolerated, so with particularly raltegravir, and you, for the backbone you can use uh, a lot of them. You have not to use staph, of course, because it's too new. So for her, we finally we decided to use raltegravir with uh, FTC-TDF, and uh, she was okay with that, and actually she has a very good follow-up uh, with, uh, with, with this uh, combination of art. So also when you switch, you can individualize also. So that's interesting because, why, why I think it's interesting because it's a lifetime treatment, but it doesn't mean that you have to stay with the same treatment all your life. So you have to adapt, you have to individualize, even the context of your patient can change uh, during his life. So when and why to switch? It could be to manage adverse event. It could be to, to prevent toxicity, or it could be to simplify regimen. It could be to address food restriction, drug-drug interaction, because of uh, possible pregnancy, or to reduce cost also. And sometimes, when you switch, it could be not dangerous, but you could have some side effects. So it was really interesting with striving. Striving, you know, it was patient very well, uh, very stable under uh, uh, boosted PI and Darinavir. Uh, uh, most of the time it was with uh, Darinavir boosted regimen. And finally, they, we asked them if they want to switch to uh, Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Sweet EC. So they have good results, but at the same time, uh, switching at the price because 10 patients discontinued for adverse effects uh, in the Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Sweet EC arm. It was interesting because uh, it, it was, they received, finally they have new side effects and they were not very happy with these side effects. So when you switch, you, sometimes you have to be careful because you will destabilize your patients. So you have to monitor them and sometimes you don't have the result you want to, to get. So if you have patients with uh, complex therapeutic stories and we have a lot of patients like that, we didn't know exactly what happens before. We, didn't, we don't have every, all genotypic tests. And we know that some, at the end, they have a detectable viral load, sometimes three, four, five years ago, and we don't know exactly what happens. So for this, patient, for this particular patient, we have interesting data, 
with a switch to uh, a Darunavir and uh, uh, Jetvoya, donc uh, Elvitegravir, Cobicista, Eftaf, and it's interesting because they have uh, superiority, virologic superiority, and we have also patient-reported outcome with treatment satisfaction questionnaire, and it was uh, significantly uh, superior, so I think it's interesting also because particularly patients that just receive two pills at the end. So one other question is, if the patient perspective could help us to individualize our new combination of art. And we particularly, what is interesting actually is, you know, like the, the if you want to, to choose between Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Sweet EC, and Bictegravir, FTAF, you know. So it was presented last year in IAS. If you check with these two a single treatment regimen, you don't find a lot of difference. You know, they have very high undetectability at week 24 and 48. So it's a bit difficult. And you don't have some emergence of, uh, uh, of uh, resistance. So really, it's, it seems very similar. But at the same time, if you check with patient reported outcome, and particularly with HIV symptom index, you will see a superiority of Bictegravir FTAF for nausea, meeting, loss of appetite, diarrhea, fatigue, uh, sad and depressed. So you are interesting uh, difference, and this difference came from the patient perspectives. And we have to integrate that because possibly in the future, it will be the only solution to differentiate two combinations. And even if, you, if they check with another patient reported outcome, the, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, they also uh, found some difference between uh, these two combinations. So even with the investigational agent, we have a new treatment, we will come. Uh, we, the question is, is this new treatment can bring new answer? So we have Doravirin. Uh, Doravirin, we have interesting data uh, when it's compared with Darunavir boosted regimen or with uh, uh, efavirenz FTC uh, tenofovir. And we have very interesting data with non inferiority. And what is interesting with uh, this uh, uh, new non nucleoside non nucleosi and NRTI, it's a once daily, very low, relatively low, low dose. Uh, we don't have data, unfortunately, compared with uh, Integraz inhibitor. He has a unique and potent resistant profile, few drug-drug interaction, and what could be interesting is that it will be the first STR, single treatment regimen, uh, combined with generics. So, of course, it, it, I think it will help to decrease the cost. One other way to individualize, why not, is to use dual therapy. And the question is, can we, do the, can we have the same uh, efficacy with dual therapy instead of three therapy. So you can possibly, you, you, you saw the rest, this recent data from SWORD 1 and 2, it's pool data, and what's a, what seems interesting for me is that just possibly, it will not be a big market for this dual therapy actually, so it's for uh, dolutegravir plus rilpivirin, uh, but because you need some very stable patients with almost no history of, uh, um, of resistance or uh, virologic escape. And what one of the problems possibly is that if you have a virologic escape, you, you will lose the, the protection uh, against resistance uh, from dolutegravir. But it could be uh, something interesting for some of our patients. So actually, uh, we have Juluca, Dolutegravir plus Ritpivirin, who is approved by the FDA, but not yet approved in Canada. Uh, and uh, we, we have also interesting data with boosted PI plus Lamivudine, sweet EC. Well, of course, you have to be careful if you have an hepatitis B, and, you have, uh, and we have to check also what would be the cost also of this new combination. So individualization, so remove the need for daily pill. Uh, I think that's really interesting, you know, so with long-acting ART, what are the, actually we have uh, in development cabotegravir and ripivirin, but we will have uh, a lot of new, we will come just after this one. So it's really interesting because when uh, we have some, we, we, are, we participate to the clinical trial with cabotegravir and ripivirin, and when I ask my patients, they are very interested uh, with this new, uh, 
way to, to, to take treatment, particularly because of confidentiality, uh, to, because it's really, for some of them, it's very good with their daily life, and they just have to, they just receive uh, uh, an injection every month, or sometimes every two months, and after that's it, they don't have to take pills every day. So, of course, it's interesting, and it, it could be a, a good answer to individualize for some of our patients. So you can see here the, 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 the result for the LATI2 uh, study design, and uh, the, you have a, a very good efficacy on maintenance period uh, with uh, the injectable versus uh, the treatment, uh, the orally treatment. And if you, uh, and it was asked for the patient what they prefer, and you have also interesting uh, data for patientreported.com, so because of the uh, injectable antiretroviral combination, uh, a lot of them were significantly more interested and more satisfied with this injectable than the oral therapy. You can also uh, individualize with generic treatment, because actually we have a lot of generic. And I, I, don't want to, to spend too much time on that, but just to, to, to mention this data, uh, this new study from our colleague from Alberta, because I think that's really interesting. They want to do a desimplification to reduce costs, because in Columbia Britannique, British Columbia uh, and Alberta, treatment antiretroviral are uh, uh, provided free. So they, and they know that actually the cost of uh, dolutegravir, uh, abacavir, sweet EC is 31% of the total cost of antiretrovirals and is almost 8 million of dollars. So they just published that in HIV medicine and they explained that if they can uh, desimplify, so to use dolutegravir and the generic of abacavir, sweet EC, they will be able to, for all, uh, for 100 patients on Triumec, they will be able to decrease the cost by $4 million. So it could be interesting for a province. And they ask the patient what they think about that. And when they ask, almost 50 persons, uh, 48, agree to, to simplify, to desimplify uh, for cost reason, and just 27 persons say no. So it could be interesting, and it's interesting because it's in this study is in Canada, but we have, uh, uh, Compa yes, a comparable study in Denmark and in, uh, in even in France, actually. They try to develop new guidelines with the use of generic, and they calculate the cost when you use generic instead of uh, the other uh, treatment. So my question now is undetectability. Is it like a tree hiding a forest? Why, why, why that? Because, you know, sometimes when I discuss with my colleagues, they tell me, OK, in my clinic, 92% uh, of my patients are undetectable. We are the best. No, in my clinic, is 94%. In my clinic, we are more than around 80%. So possibly we have to do better. But So if we have very high undetectability, can we do something better? And if you ask patients, I'm not sure the satisfaction of HIV care is 92 or 94%. So we have to, that's my question, is if we just take in account undetectability, is it like a tree hiding a forest? And why not? The, one of the problems is undetectability is possibly not a good marker for a good adherence. Because actually, you because of pardonance, because of forgiveness, uh, antiretroviral therapy are more efficient, better tolerated, and simpler. So possibly, even you take your treatment 80% of your time, you, you will be able to, to stay undetectable. Even in France, they did some study with treatment four days a week, and people were undetectable. And actually, they have a, a, a bigger study to evaluate that. So even for patients, you know, oh, you told me to take my, patient, my treatment every day, but you have study with treatment four days a week. Uh, OK, so possibly uh, adherence and detectability, we need a detectability for all of our patients, but possibly we need other surrogate markers. And you know, even if we check for adherence, we know that we have only part of the problem is due to the patients, but we have also other problems. It could be copayment, it could be uh, trouble with the access to the clinic, access to the pharmacy, trouble with the healthcare provider. So we have a lot of uh, uh, problems. We can have an impact on the adherence on how we can catch this problem. And recent, we have recent uh, interesting uh, literature on how to integrate the uh, uh, 
another 90%. So it means that 90% of people who are undetectable who could have also a good quality of life. So we have to find new surrogate markers to, to evaluate that. So possibly it will be to, to, to go from total patient care to total patient-centered care and to better integrate the patient perspective in our daily care and how this patient perspective could have an impact in your uh, antiretroviral treatment choice as a clinician. And you can see, uh, if you use patient reported outcome, you could have something interesting for individualization of care. So a patient can report his daily life with his or her disease. And after that, it, can, it could help to improve the clinician-patient communication. Also, it could be a possibility to recognize and to detect earlier unrecognized problems. So it's a patient detection. And how can you know, you, you remember Marcelo, I think with patient-reported outcome, possibly he could uh, tell me that he has a problem with his co-payment. So it could be new marker to monitor treatment response. Uh, it could be a good way uh, to have individualization of care, a better patient engagement also in this care because he has to give more feedback and this feedback is integrated and also it could be a better patient satisfaction and improved health outcome. And for individualization, you know, which future do we want? I didn't know if you, if you saw this, uh, it was uh, presented uh, recently by the, uh, and approved by the FDA, is the first connected pill with uh, uh, aripiprazole. It's a treatment for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And it's interesting because when you ingest the, the treatment, uh, you will have a reaction with the gastric suc, and you will have, you know, a, a Bluetooth signal uh, for the uh, healthcare provider. So you know, you can see here, uh, on Monday, he, sometimes he takes his treatment, or sometimes he doesn't take his treatment. But, so it could be another way to, to do individualization, or why not to, to be sure that we have uh, adherence to treatment. But you know, it's adherence without the patients. And it's, it could be like potentially a coercive tool. Uh, and I think uh, patient-reported outcomes are more interesting, particularly for HIV, because it's the patient we inform. And with this connected pill, it's the pills we inform about adherence, not the patients. So it's adherence evaluation despite the patients. And with patient reported outcome, we could have patients feedback and adherence evaluation with a strong input of the patient. So that's why uh, we, uh, I tried to, to, to develop with my team a, a new electronic EPRO. So you know patient-centered, uh, patient-reported or patient-centered outcome. Uh, what is interesting is HIV care we don't have actually, and we don't use patient-reported outcome. Uh, you can see sometimes we have treatment satisfaction questionnaire, but it was developed with Crixiva. You have a justice questionnaire, so HIV distress symptom index, but also it's a very old questionnaire. And we don't have, we don't have pro patient-reported outcome for or HIV care in 2018. And in other uh, fields of medicine, in diabetology, they use it, in cancerology, even in surgery, they use it. But in HIV, I think we have, we have to do better. So patient engagement in their care, of course, uh, all of my patients can uh, do patient-reported outcomes. Sometimes they are, not, they are too sick, and really, they, they just need to, 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 follow, to follow my advice. But after that, when they are doing much better, they can do something more. They, are, they can be more integrated in my care. So that's why we, we developed, since uh, January 2016, the I-score study. So it's, uh, it's a new uh, EPRO. So you can see the I-score study site. So it's between France and Canada. And in Vancouver, we have VIDC. We have two sites uh, in uh, St. Michael Hospital. And also in uh, Montreal, it's uh, uh, my clinic in the Clinic Virus Services and the Clinic Medical Actuel. And we have also uh, five sites in France. So two in, uh, one in the French uh, Caribbean in St. Martin Island and one also in the French Guiana because it's a very unique uh, 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 context for HIV population. So what we did, we did like a conceptual framework with, and we tried to, 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 to figure uh, uh, the several perceived barriers to a good uh, adherence to art. 
And uh, so what is it? Our I score will, will be a multi-domain patientreporty.com, like an index of difficulty of taking antiretroviral uh, regimen. And it will be a connected pro, so it will be on a smartphone, tablet, or web base. It will be filled out at home or in clinic prior to the uh, healthcare provider visit. And uh, actually, we, we de eight uh, uh, students in biomedical engineering uh, developed the first version of this application and of the dashboard, and it was just presented last uh, week uh, in Polytechnic Montreal. And what is interesting also, that if you want to do a patient reporting.com, you have to, 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 to have a huge patient engagement. And we develop a huge patient engagement. And since the beginning of, the, of our study, we have a, a committee, a patient advisory committee, and we meet them almost, one of my postdocs meets them ev almost every month. And we uh, show them our last results, or we uh, show them exactly, and they, they make a huge change in your, uh, even in your protocol, and really it's much, much better. And they, they are really expert, actually, even in patientreporty.com or in, digit, in connected medicine, so that's uh, really interesting. And the idea is it is to be their pro, and we want really to have a pro with very, we could take care of their particular needs. Also, you have to engage clinicians because it's not easy for clinicians to, to accept new, uh, a lot of data, to accept uh, how to use PRO. So we, we integrate them in Canada or in France, and we publish on that, and we have very interesting feedback for a lot of uh, clinicians. Uh, and also, it has to be their PRO. And we, we have to do also, also, it's interesting because, because we try to engage uh, also young researcher and uh, I was awarded last year for a, a mentorship chair from CIHR in patient-oriented research and innovative clinical uh, care in um, uh, clinical trials in IHRV. And it's interesting because two of our researchers are living with chronic condition was with IHRV, and they really they have a, they, they can bring their, this double expertise as a patient and as a, um, as a researcher, and it's really interesting to, to, to ameliorate uh, our perspective, our research program. So this, uh, uh, this patient reporting.com will be in an application, uh, an electronic application, to, to administer this ProMeasure in HIV care. So you can see it will be the Marvin application, Marvin for minimal antiretroviral uh, interference. So it will be you saw in this application, they, will, they can will have the possibility to include their data, their regimen, last vial load, last CD4. They will receive the questionnaire of the month, so it's possible to, to, to do a particular version of this application depending on the clinic or depending on the country. And they will be able also to contact a numeric coach or to contact their doctor, depending on the uh, possibility with the clinic. And you can see here we have also a new way to answer to questions. So even if you, uh, you have trouble of literacy, you can uh, easily answer to, to this question. So yeah, we can do a lot of interesting things to, to help patients to, to, to fill all this questionnaire, this question, and also to, um, to continue to use it longitudinally. And we think it could be an impact on HIV care models. And in France, they are particularly interested to uh, transform some uh, visit in virtual visit because most of the HIV care in France are uh, hospital-based, so it's very expensive. And they told me that if we can prove that we can decrease even by one uh, visit each year, every two years with this uh, application, it will be very cost-effective. And also, we want to try to use it with pharmacists and with other healthcare uh, provider to know exactly what could be the best uh, way to use it. So it will be part of our implementation trial, and we want to use the platform trial to do that. So all iScore users will be included in this platform trial. It's a new way to do clinical trials. And it's really interesting because you know you can, uh, you can choose different way and you can try to, to, to evaluate different way of uh, of using this application in different countries with different language, and you can, um, yeah, and you can validate that with platform trials. So it's really interesting. Actually, you don't have to use just randomized controlled trial to do implementation and to 
to evaluate longitudinally uh, this new patient reported outcome or these new applications. So as a conclusion, uh, we work together for one, one hour now, so I think uh, uh, I tried to, to show you that it's important still to individualize treatment and not to have the choice between two combinations of art, because HIV is a long, a lifelong illness, uh, versus a, a chronic disease, so it's not only to prolong life, but really it's to try to, to help our patient to have a good life uh, with HIV, and possibly some of our patients will take uh, HIV medication for 40 or 50 years until we will find a, a, a good cure for HIV. So no, no combination of arts fits for all, so we have, uh, I think we have still a lot of room for individualization and we have to use all the tools we have actually, all the combination of art we have actually. Possibly there is a need for new HIV surrogate markers to better integrate the, the, the patient perspective. So that's why I tried to develop this adaptive EPRO for HIV care and I hope it will be a good way to complement uh, HIV viral load and CD4 uh, testing. And I think it's important to personalize, to personalize HIV follow-up and to try to have uh, clinical care more patient-centered. So thank you for your attention, and if you have a question, it's your time now. And I think we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions. We have wonderful staff here circulating with microphones. So please raise your hand and they'll come around and uh, can answer any questions uh, from uh, Bertrand. Um, so please feel free to raise hands if you have any questions. Bertrand, I thought I would leave a question uh, from my practice this week. My oldest patient with HIV came in and he's turning 90 next month. And we're looking at how do we optimize his treatment in a very older patient with very little data in the literature, if any at all, what would be your optimal theoretical regimen for that kind of person? <laughs> that's, that's a very good question. I'm not sure to have the answer, but really I think uh, uh, particularly with this aging population, I think the problem of polypharmacy, drug-drug interaction, I think it's a, it's a huge problem. Most of the time they receive a lot of pills, so it depends. One of my colleagues will answer to you, use a single treatment regimen to decrease the number of pills. Other colleague will possibly, and me, I told you no, possibly just first drug, less drug-drug interaction. So why not to use a, a multiple treatment regimen? But really we have, uh, and you're right, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big problem actually because we have to, and you have to integrate not only HIV care, but all the problem he could have because of his age and how we can, and if you have still room, I think, for individualization, and sometimes we can do something interesting. But of course, pharmacists are very, if you are pharmacists in your unit, most of the time they are very helpful to, to help you to, to find the, the good way to individual, individualize treatment for this uh, age uh, guy. Any questions that uh, people want to have answered right now? I see one in the front here. Bertrand, I wanted to first of all congratulate you. That was an excellent talk. A very compelling argument for individualizing therapy. And like you, um, I think all of us that are frontline clinicians really understand the importance of individualizing therapy. Um, but there are pressures uh, that we face, and those pressures are guidelines that speak a little bit against individualization, right? It's very much a movement about you know, one regimen to deal with a lot of solutions. So I, I compel you on that. But I was going to say that nationally, you've been hearing about also the Choosing Wisely program. And the Choosing Wisely program is very much about, in some ways, uh, well, I won't say it's against individualization, but it certainly it ties your hands a bit because it's very much about cost restraints and, and justification of costs. So how do, you, how do we balance those competing interests? Because as a clinician, I totally agree with you. And I, we all do that in our individual practice. You've given a 90-year-old example. We could even say for a 60-year-old example, you should individualize care. But we have pressures, cost-sensitive environments, choosing wisely programs. How do we balance those two competing interests? Yeah, yeah you're right. You're totally right. And I think, you know, if, you, if we put the patient needs first, you know, if you can put the patient at the center, possibly, you know, you will be able to... Yeah, to, to try to, to, to find a, a place for every 
all of these uh, requirements. But I think even, you know, in the, actually in the recommendation, there is nothing about generic, you know? So I think what, the, I think the, the recommendation for clinicians, they have to integrate the, the generic use and what could be the, the impact of the, uh, of the generic use. And after, I think really we have to, uh, yes, you, you're right, you, you have a lot of constraint. And I think me, uh, what I, because actually in Quebec, we, have, we are relatively free to choose what we want. But I think really I, uh, I try and discuss with my patient even the context of cost. Huh? Sometimes I told you, okay, I can give you an S tier, but you know with a multiple treatment regimen, I will decrease the cost of your treatment. Are you agree with that? Is it a big, a big, a huge problem for you or not? So I think even like they did in, uh, in Alberta, we can, we can integrate that in our, uh, uh, and also we can, also, and we have data. We have to, 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 to check about data and why not to, to ask pharmaceutical company to do new, uh, new clinical trials, you know, specifically for Canada to, to try to answer for specific question. Because also we have specific population and I know that even if you are in Montreal, in Quebec, or if you are in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, or it's not a, the same context. And sometimes you don't have the same access to care. So you will choose, uh, diff depending on this context, you will choose different uh, combination of art because you, you have stability or not, and you know that you will be able to, to, to follow, your, follow up your patient more frequently or less frequently. So of course you have, you have to deal with that, yeah. Any other questions? I see one back here, sorry, part of that. Hello. So I don't know if this question is outside of your expertise, but you're already building this app that connects the patients to the doctor. Are you considering um, expanding the app to be able to connect the patients to each other? Because a lot of what sick people feel is isolated. And if you already have this community you're building, you could build an, uh, a virtual community of patients that can talk to each other even anonymously and provide support. Is yeah. that possible? Yeah, yeah, I know you're right. I, I didn't have a lot of time to, to present all the, for, particularly for this application and for the new pro, we, we, we work a lot with a community group and uh, uh, we, we know that we will have a, normally a, a good support for them and we know that most of the time it will be a patient who will invite another patient, one of his friends, to, to use this application. And why not, it could be a possibility to link them to link this patient with uh, Ashali Care Center. So, and we want to do that, and also we want to evaluate, uh, even if in the community group, they can be, you know, they like a healthcare provider to discuss with the patient with this application. So we want to evaluate that also, yes, of course. And we want really to, to, to even, and why not to have, you know, like this group of patients, patient likes me or this thing, and to try to develop thing, uh, similar things with this application, yeah. Possibly not in the first version, but we, we hope to do that for the, the next version, yeah. Thank you, Mike. One of my questions about the iPro, I think it's a very innovative project, and um, what are you finding with the uptake of it across different age groups? Youth versus middle age, to what are you finding the interest level amongst different patient groups? Yeah, that's, uh, frequently I have this question, you know, what is interesting actually that even if you check on Facebook, the, the senior, uh, people who are more than 50 years old, they are, there is a huge increase of use of application, of uh, Facebook, of a lot of things. So I'm thinking, and we have literature on that, we have data, uh, possibly we have no problem with our aging population, just to, to help them to, to manipulate that, but I think it will be possible. We know that it will not be uh, fully accessible for all population. So we will, uh, it will be part of our implementation trial to, to try to figure out which population will be the, the best and uh, for which population we have, to, um, uh, we have to help them to use it if it could be helpful for them or not. But I think it will not only, it will not be this application only for, you know, for the young geek. Huh? 
And really, we'll, uh, it's very, I was very surprised when I checked the literature with my colleague on or what happened. We have data from Toronto or outside. What happens even in uh, a family practice group, even with older populations, they use, they accept to use it very, very easily. And most of the time, they told them that they seem it's more uh, confidential to use an application than to fill a paper questionnaire because you don't know like, after where will if the paper questionnaire will not be just on the table, you know, like that, with no confidence, with confidentiality issue. So, uh, I think really we we will we will evaluate that, but potentially we have uh, uh, several population. Even I, I discuss with people from uh, Saskatoon, and they told me that uh, uh, most of the patients they they, they have. Uh, a smartphone because when you are alone in Saskatchewan, you need a smartphone to, to, to stay in contact with your friends and with your colleague or why not with your doctor. So they told me that it will not be even for them a, a huge problem to use a, an application. Very good. I'm, I'm using the chair's uh, prerogative. Uh, one other question I had uh, just from my practice as well is curiosity about the refugee popu populations you're dealing with and resistance issues. Have you found any patterns with people coming from Africa where the previous regimens may have been suboptimal? And uh, how are you dealing with that in practice with some of the capitation and other issues you face? Oh, no, that's a really good question. Most of the time, they, they are naive patients when they came here. But they told us, yes, I didn't, I didn't know before that I, I had a, an HIV infection. We have just to trust them. And so we, when we did genotypic tests, we didn't find any uh, concern, any major concern with uh, resistance. So, and we tried to use uh, a good combination to have no problem with that because most of the time, we treat them the same day, actually. Yeah with rapid art. Huh? Most, I think, uh, and possibly my colleague, she's not here, but Nadine, Kronf ah, Nadine is here. She, she, she is the youngest doctor in our center, so she received 80% of these refugee, and most of the time she treats them uh, between one to seven days. Huh? So really, because we have a lot of them, and they, they want to, be, to get treated as soon as possible. It's part of the integration to Canada. So, and we don't have a lot of problem with that. So really we can use with uh, an integrase inhibitor based regimen. Uh, it's not a problem. Or even we can use Darunavir boosted regimen. And we, and we can treat them as soon as possible, even without waiting for the genotypic test. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for again for an excellent presentation. Thank you to the audience for coming. Uh, I wish to again acknowledge Merck's generous support of this event bringing us together and I hope everyone has a very fruitful and stimulating car. Thank you very much.